Hey everyone, it's Steph. I'm excited to be back with you today. We're going to chat a little bit about the books that I read during the month of April and take a look at my reading stats for the month. I like to split them up into categories because I read physical copies of books, audiobooks, and ebooks. All of these books are from the library, so I haven't paid for any of these books, but I'm grateful for what the library has to offer, especially during this quarantine time. I've been able to get a lot of books electronically on my iPad and on my phone so that I can still cover new stories and read new books. I read a total of 32 books. Three of them were physical books, nine audiobooks, 21 ebooks. I've read a total of 10,231 pages. So don't feel too shabby about that. As much as the numbers are fun to dive into, it's also just neat to see from my own knowledge what kind of themes I'm interested in or what kind of themes I'm drawn to during the month. And during this past month, I read a lot of books to do with Regency romance, and then I kind of switched over to contemporary romance, and I've also read some art books. I really enjoy kind of anything that gets my creative juices flowing, anything that just kind of makes me feel inspired. One of the artistic books that I really enjoyed is called Mail Me Art. And Mail Me Art is all about art on different pieces of mail. Now this is an easy one to kind of get through quickly because a lot of it's pictures, but it's not entirely. And the thing that really struck me about this was it just inspired me to make art wherever I can. It's not about creating a beautiful canvas that's going to stretch 12 feet by 12 feet all over a museum wall, but we can make beauty and art in the ordinary things that we see and interact with every day. And I really like that idea. Uh, the second artistic book I really enjoyed is Sharpie Art Workshop is all about creating work using exclusively different kinds of Sharpies. And he goes through all the different brands or all the different styles that he uses for different techniques. And I just thought this was really neat because he creates art on all different surfaces, whether it be on walls, pieces of clothing, small items, large items around the house, and purposing things from thrift stores and kind of giving them a lift or, or giving them some kind of new life to them. The concept of being able to take something ordinary, something that maybe other people wouldn't look at twice and make art out of it. And that was a really neat idea to me. Both of them had this concept of taking ordinary materials and creating art out of them and creating art on everyday kind of pieces, whether that be things around the house, on mail, just things that we normally interact with. We don't have to go out of our way to create beautiful art. And I thought that was really neat. It makes it very accessible and makes it feel like anybody can make art, which of course we can. But I feel like sometimes we have this conceptualized idea that if it's not worthy of hanging up in a museum, then it must not be good enough or it must not be as good as somebody else's work. Well, why can't we just all be good as we are? So, yeah, I'm all about making art and enjoying making art no matter what level of artist you feel that you are or someone else says that you are. Have fun with it. If it brings you joy, then it's worth spending the time doing. So the next books that I've read are two books in a series. The first one is called Promises and Primroses. Julia is hired by Peter to be a governess for his home for his young children. He is a widower. He has recently been granted a gift from his uncle that allows him to have an extra stipend of money to make his living more comfortable, more easy, if he will get married. So that's the stipulation. Peter's not comfortable accepting this. He's kind of like, I'm not going to remarry. Eventually, over time, his heart starts to thaw, so to speak, and he starts to kind of see what Julia brings to his household. He also loves to breed dogs and hunting dogs and things of that nature. And he comes to find out that she has a way with dogs. He gets to know her through seeing her expertise with the way she is with his children, with the dogs, with the puppies that he's raising and kind of sees another side to her that otherwise, by social convention, he would not have been able to see. So I really enjoyed that. That was the start of a series. The series is continuing. The third one just came out this month. If Peter's family members are kind of considered to be rogues or uh, off the beaten path or not quite following societal convention. So the second book is about his younger brother, Timothy, perception of 
being a rogue, but it's not quite accurate. He doesn't have any kind of vindictive or manipulative qualities to him. There is a young woman he meets by the name of Marianne has recently come into this fortune. And unfortunately, that news gets spread about all over town and all these like old crotchety guys or these guys who have no money are coming to her and trying to marry her and gain her fortune. So they both agree to help each other find people that are suitable to them and then they start to realize hmm are they falling for each other hmm hmm so I enjoyed seeing that dynamic I really enjoyed this these two reads um, especially the second one I gave them both four stars and I look forward to seeing what the third one has let's see number three we have Arabella where we have the daughter of a vicar one the oldest daughter of many children in the vicar's family who was going to stay with her aunt and kind of experience society. On their way to town, she meets, if I say his name right, Mr. Robert Bomeres. And Robert is a very wealthy, very similar to Darcy, kind of brooding, kind of serious, very upstanding member of society, and uh, very wealthy. And what she ends up doing is she ends up hearing a conversation with his friend from the other room about how women with no fortune are always like trying to give him attention, trying to manipulate him into kind of maybe a compromising position so they have to marry this woman for the sake of her honor. Basically is wondering and speculating from the other room if Arabella is one of those ladies. So she's walking back to the room and Sheik is like, well fine, then you know what, I'm just gonna like pretend that I'm witch and wealthy and I don't need you. So she walks back in the room and basically makes such claims. She states that she has a large fortune, she's going to London to find a husband, with a season, whatever, whatever. And the mess starts there. She goes on to London. It is circulated that this woman has lots of money, all these men are paying attention to her. She starts to panic when the expectation that she has a large fortune is affecting these relationships that she has, some of which are positive relationships and some of which are negative. I really enjoyed seeing how this story developed, how it grew, and I can see why Georgia Iyer is like such a classic for historical fiction. She very much writes in a style similar to Austen. This was a little bit slow starting off, but once we got to the story and really the heart of the story, I really enjoyed reading it, and I definitely would like to read some more by her. All right. Next one on the list is one I talked about in my disabilities video, Lies, Love, and Breakfast at Tiffany's by Julie Wright. Really enjoyed this story. The representation of being half blind was really neat. Um, I also really enjoyed the dynamic between the two characters. We have, oh my gosh, what's her name? Sylvia and Ben. And Sylvia and Ben, it was neat to see them both working in Hollywood as film editors and seeing that dynamic and how their work impacts their kind of mindset and their discussions about movies, a lot of pop culture references to Audrey Hepburn, hence the title. Um, so I enjoyed seeing that as well and just kind of seeing the different perceptions of, you know, Audrey Hepburn as this class glamorous music movie star, but she was also kind-hearted. She also was heavily involved with UNICEF and giving of herself to other people who were less fortunate than herself. So I enjoyed seeing the dynamic and seeing what the author developed the two characters into and how they came ended up coming together in the end of the story, which was really sweet. I also read Harry Potter 4 this month, The Goblet of Fire. I've been enjoying rereading the Harry Potter series and this one was no disappointment. It's just so great to revisit these books not only to be a part of this world again, but I'm especially enjoying a refresher of all the things are not in the movies. I'm not bashing the movies. You can only fit so much into like a two, two and a half hour time slot, but reading about Peeves, reading about the dynamics between the Gryffindor common room folks, and reading about, you know, oh my gosh, Fred and George are just amazing. I mean, we already knew they're amazing, but just they spend so much time with Harry and Ron, especially during the summer months, and reading more about Bill and Percy and Charlie. 
the Quidditch World Cup and all that went on with that. We have Winky the house elf who's not in the movie. Um, again, not bashing it, just like, whoa, oh my gosh, like these things and all the dynamics and spew which isn't in it and going down into the kitchen and seeing the house elves and seeing Dobby again. Um, so I love all the things that are happening there and seeing how that's developing um, throughout the story and this great, great literary world. Yeah. And one more I read this month that I really, really enjoyed. This was a reread, one that is very near and dear to my heart. I really enjoyed reading it. It's called Seeking Persephone. You may or may not be familiar with the mythological story of Persephone being tricked, so to speak, by Hades in the underworld the story I learned about in high school. Since then, I've gotten into the show Hades Town and learning more about that soundtrack, and I'm enjoying it. Hades Town makes such a point of creating. Hades as an evil character for the sake of moving the plot along uh, in order to develop his character and his relationship with Persephone. However, it's not entirely accurate. It's kind of meant to make the show work. The story is much more rooted in how Hades and Persephone... Oh, it's so good. I like, don't even know where to start. I immediately was intrigued by this character because he is supposed to be a personification of Hades. He's not a nice guy. He... scratch that. He is not a nice guy on the surface. He's very imposing, intimidating. He was born without an ear, and medical experts of the day decided they'd go fishing for it. Maybe it was under the skin. So he had many surgeries as a young child. This is mid-1800s. So these scars often serve as imposing and intimidating other people, and not to mention the scowls he wears and the way he kind of expresses his face. And I'm smiling because his development throughout the story is just phenomenal. Basically, has his solicitor find a family who has a daughter of marriageable age that can't refuse a large amount of money. And Persephone's family fits that bill perfectly. Persephone's family is struggling financially. Her father is a college professor, but he's very flighty. He's very much into his books, academically minded, very negligent of his family. Persephone has been taking care of these kids and making sure that their day-to-day -day needs are met. We slowly start to see things thaw between them and the way that they both let their guard down. Sweet and heartfelt and funny. Like, Sarah Eden writes such funny dialogue. It just, it's great. And in addition to seeing Adam and Persephone during this, this story, Adam's best friend, Harry, his only friend really, is there uh, visiting at the household during a lot of their relationship. So we see not only Adam, who's and Persephone, who's like trying her best. We see Harry, who's this very, very jovial, smiley, kind of happy guy. It's such a stark contrast to Adam and all his Hades grumpiness. Harry provides a buffer for them, and he enables them to kind of provide perspectives other than their own. So it's good stuff. Really good stuff. Thoroughly enjoyed it. So those are um, my favorites from the month. I did enjoy some contemporary romance as well, but none of them made the top picks for the month. So I look forward to seeing what the month of May has to bring. A few authors that I really enjoy reading who are coming out with books in May and June. So I'm really excited to see kind of where that goes and what that leads to. So I hope that you find something that is filling your heart with joy and bringing a smile to your face. Hopefully we can find some fun ways to pass this quarantine time and bring some sunshine to our lives. So I hope that you enjoyed this video, and I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Thanks so much for watching, I'll see you guys soon. My reading for the month of April before, then we're gonna, so we're gonna take a, so I get, blah, blah, blah.